Yeah. Yeah, and I just get more guitar. Right? <laughs> Kill those and be like, why don't I have enough stamps? That is the problem. So my, my music room now has two five guitar stamps in it. <laughs> have you ever liked those, like, the rack ones that are, like, in a guitar case? Uh, I've never had
9.33. It's already time. It's what? Then there's the... Check, check. Working? Maybe not? Yes? Ooh, there you go. Act two? Yes. Perfect. Go ahead and mute this one. Good morning. Welcome to Camp Hill UMC. Thanks for joining us for a sound check here. Hope that wasn't too loud on the ears. Um, we're going to check out our announcement video here uh, before we get started. And I'm Pastor Jason. Welcome to worship. And this is our friend Claire. She's joining us today. Claire, it's an exciting week. We got uh, trick-or-treating going on this week. What are you going to dress up as? A witch. A witch. That should be really exciting. And maybe scary. I'll put a spell on you. Oh, goodness. Well, I hope the spell is that we have a lot of fun. And we've got some fun coming up for young adults on November 10th. That is a Sunday at noon. We're getting together at Trendle Bowl to go bowling. Just a great time of fellowship, just hanging out together and doing life. So if you're interested, sign up on the Church Center app or contact me via email. And on Sunday, November 3rd, we are going to fill the van for Bethesda Mission. I got to go with... Chris won Friday night and meet some of the people that live out in tents and um, out just outside, really. And it's a wonderful mission that we can help them. So fill the van, and you can find out more information in our announcements of what to bring. And so we're also looking for volunteers to help out with cookie time. Uh, on Sunday mornings, we've got some great people that make these cookies happen. We've got volunteers who have signed up. But we're looking for people who want to come in early. I get here to the church at 8 in the morning. And, uh, Bless it, your heart. <laughs> it's my time of day. And we are looking for some people who can show up about 8.30 to start prepping the coffee uh, before worship and making it happen in the community space, the gathering space. So, and cleaning up after. Exactly. We need some to stay late. So if that's you, sign up on the Church Center app, email the church office. We'd love to have you volunteer. All right, shall we worship? Let's worship. Good morning. Let's, let's stand together here uh, and greet one another here before we sing. All right, and we invite you to stay, remain standing here as you're able. And also, just so you know, like, you can always sit, stand, however you uh, want to participate in worship. 
Um, this is our time here together. We want you to be comfortable um, sensing God's presence here together. Let's sing.
over your horizon I'm caught in the folds of your tide Like mountains born in fire Born again by your desire I'm caught in the heart of the world you can You are making all things new You are making everything new You are making all things new You are making everything, everything You are making all things new You are making everything new You are making all things new You are making everything, everything I'm caught in your heart space, that there'd be room yeah, for all of the all of the pain, all of the joys of, of those around us, that, that, our, that our own heart space would, would grow just a bit. your heart come come here this morning God just fill this room fill this space fill our hearts with your love it's in the name of Christ we pray amen you can have a seat
Good morning and welcome to worship. My name is Pastor Jason. Uh, it is awesome to be here. We're starting a whole new series this week entitled Navigating the News, what it's like to engage life, life that happens nationwide, locally, life that happens, well, this week as we talk about elections. And this week's theme, as you just heard it by our newsy broadcaster, is all about unity. Coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul writes these words to the church, beginning in verse 10. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church, rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's households have told me about quarrels among you, my dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying that I follow Paul, or I, and others are saying I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, for now no one can say that they were baptized into my name. Oh, yes, I, I also baptized the household of Stephanus, and I don't remember baptizing anyone else. For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news, and not with clever speech for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Every day we go to war again. We assume we know so much more than them, for we hear what they have to say. Headline breaks, we start to hate again, We're calling them names again. We give our peace away I hope they see it I want to see it I hope we believe it I want to see I want to see the love Oh Day by day, hope fades away again. We know that there is pain within, we cannot medicate. Learn to fear, learn to begin again. Open our eyes again. Our brothers pain. I hope they see it as I wanna see it. I hope we believe it. I wanna see, I wanna see. around you it's 
God of grace and mercy, Lord of peace and unity. Gracious God, you sent your son Jesus into this world that we might be united. United in purpose, united as your children, united as your people and your church. And our prayer this morning for this time of worship is that we might be united in spirit. That by your spirit, the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts may be pleasing unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. How many of you are stressed out over the last four years? <laughs> Did the election season ever end? <laughs> We seem to have gone from one election right into the next, and, and it has weighed so heavy on us as a country, as a culture, as a society. As I have talked to friends internationally, they have looked at the United States and said, whoa, I couldn't do that. Well, my wife and I, we, we took a vacation with our family earlier this year, and, and we were in Rome and we were on a cruise, actually, and, and the couple that sat at our table was from Britain. They lived in England, just outside of London. And one evening at dinner, we talked about the election, and they said, how do you do it? Ours lasted three weeks, and that was more than enough. Yours seems to have never ended. You jumped from one into the next. And in fact, it is showing up all over our lives. The Pew Research Foundation recently completed a survey of Americans, and they found that 76% of Americans are suffering from chronic election fatigue. The stress is wearing us out. It's manifesting itself in physical ailments. You wake up in the morning tired. You enter every conversation on eggshells about to be triggered. Everything just pushes it to the edge. In fact, 88%, 88% of Americans believe there are strong conflicts within our society. That is second only to South Korea, brothers and sisters. We are struggling to find unity as a country, and we are concerned about the outcome of next Tuesday's election. In fact, 70% are seriously concerned about violence being a possible outcome, and more than 50% have considered that this might be the end of democracy? Is that a thing? I certainly hope not. 
I hope in my deepest heart of hearts that they're wrong, but I also know I can't control that. I can't control what happens next Tuesday. What I can control is what I do next Wednesday. What is in my scope of control and power is my behavior and my choices and how I follow Christ. That, brothers and sisters, is what we control. I know I've talked to many within the church, some here at Chum and some beyond the church, and lots of people hate the possibility, hate the even uh, mention that Jesus uh, might get involved in politics, that, that we might talk about politics in the church. They're like, no, no, the church has no place in the voting booth. Okay, but let's not confuse the fact that Jesus is political. As you read the scriptures, as you read the gospels, Jesus is most definitely political. Jesus starts his life as a refugee to an unwed mother. He then challenges the political leadership of the day. He instructs his, so, his followers for social justice and reform for women, children, the poor, the marginalized, immigrants, and the disabled. And then he has the gall to declare himself the fulfillment of God's promise of a one world order called the Messiah, the Christ. Brothers and sisters, we believe, we affirm, in fact, we celebrate that Jesus is political. Jesus lifts us up beyond this temporal realm into God's holy kingdom. We praise God for that. But it's important to acknowledge that Jesus is not partisan. Jesus does not side with one side over the other. Jesus does not vote red or blue or green or purple. Jesus is outside the system. And in fact, in Scripture, when people try to take hold of Jesus and claim him for themse themselves, he rebels. Simon the Zealot tries to claim Jesus as his own, and he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. The Zealots, the, the people who want to overthrow the government of the day, they're like, yeah, revolution, Jesus. And he's like, no, guys, that's not why I'm here. In fact, he had the power to overthrow the government. He had the power to unseat Pontius Pilate. And yet, in a conversation right before Jesus is crucified, he chooses death over overthrowing the government. Our Jesus would not allow his message to be compromised by any human authority. So how is it that we as people of faith worship and follow a Lord who is political, not partisan? How is it that we as people of faith may enter the next two weeks to do the same? Because I believe we are called to do the same. Some religions believe that they should abdicate political activity. My sister is a Jehovah's Witness, and she wants nothing to do with voting, and I respect her decision. Others believe that they should vote deeply and regularly and maybe more than once in election. I don't know. <laughs> There's definitely something exciting about voting. It gives you an opportunity to... to Make a decision. In my office uh, at the agency, at the insurance agency, we have a young woman who recently immigrated here from Spain. And she took her citizenship test a, a couple of years ago. And this is the first time she will ever vote in an election. Do you understand how excited she is? She is over, overjoyed to, to have her voice heard even if it's only one voice out of millions. 
She's excited about the candidate she, she's voting for. In fact, I hope that, that you may find some, some excitement, you may find some attraction to the candidate that you are voting for. We follow our leaders, don't we? As followers, we identify with something about our leaders. There's something about them that, that speaks to us, something about the vision that they've cast for the future, uh, something about the problems that they've identified in our present. Uh, as followers, we, we want to be like our leaders, and, and the leaders we choose, that we have something in common. We see ourselves in the stump speech, and they represent our passions and our lifestyles and you know, it's kind of like a band. We buy the merch, don't we? <laughs> we want to show our support. We want to be there. And that's a good thing. And that needs to be kept in balance, kept in check. In the early church, as Paul was traveling and planting church after church. He was keeping tabs on them, and, and he ran into much of this problem in the early church. People who were identifying with their leader more than God. People who were letting their faith be swept away by the current issues. In his first letter to the church at Corinth, uh, Paul is addressing a situation of division that is springing up in the church. Uh, people are, are getting divided over who brought them to the faith. Some of them are saying, oh, well, I, I follow Paul. Uh, no, no, I follow Apollos. No, I follow Peter. No, I follow Christ. The early church is being divided over the things that, that are important to them and, and and they're allowing these things to trump their faith. See, in the early church, Paul had traveled so broadly. He's the most prolific New Testament writer because he traveled from town to town to town, planting congregations everywhere. And people were so excited about him because Paul brought something new. Paul brought the message of Jesus Christ to more than just the Jews. And so for the people that Paul converted, for the early teachers and disciples that Paul had, they were thrilled. They were like, oh my gosh, Paul is the coolest thing since sliced bread, but we don't have sliced bread yet, so Paul's just cool. <laughs> Paul was so different and, and so exciting for them because he, he made the law uh, something that was set aside, something that, that divided them from, from God. Uh, Paul made the law approachable. He made a relationship with Jesus and with God seem natural. And so, man, they followed Paul with a passion. And those other people, those Jews who converted to Jesus, man, they just followed Peter. They kept the law. They wore the tassels on their clothes. They, they kept their beards long and their women covered their heads. They, they lived a very different lifestyle. They didn't eat whatever they wanted to eat. They could not have a cheeseburger. It's very sad. And yet those faithful Jews, as they came to understand Jesus in a new way, they appreciated Peter so much because Peter reached out through the law and said, look, this Jesus is the fulfillment. And then Peter went on to set an example of how a faithful Jew would live. And the people who followed Peter were so excited. Man, he makes it make sense. I can be a good Jew. And then there were those who followed Apollos. Apollos sounds like a fancy Greek name, doesn't it? That's exactly what it is. Apollos was a brilliant man. He was a debater and a philosophizer. Apollos liked to sit around and navel gaze and discuss uh, over the, the calm of the fire late into the evening. Apollos was a deep thinker. And the people who were attracted to Apollos, man, they loved to chew the faith and sometimes chew the fat. Uh, but, but Apollos, was, uh, he made the, the faith engaging and, and, and the, the dug their nails into it, and, and they, they could grab it. And the people who followed Apollos were, 
were so dedicated and they, they came to understand the message of Christ in a, a new and abstract way that he was setting a, a new possibility, a, a new paradigm for the ethical and moral engagement of the divine. Okay, not a lot of Apollos followers here. One by one, the church started to fall into little camps where they followed Peter or Paul or Paulus and and those who wanted to rise above the fray. They said, you know what? It ain't about that. It's about Jesus. I follow Christ. I'm better than you. (laughs) And therein lies the fatal flaw, doesn't it? Christ is wonderful. Christ is the Messiah. Christ is our leader. And yet claiming that we are better than we have lost Christ. The early church becomes divided over all of their differences. Their differences rooted in their leaders of faith. And they lost sight of their commonalities. They lost sight of God. They lost sight of redemption. They lost sight of grace. They lost sight of faith. They lost sight of the humanity of one another and the unity of community. It's beautiful, isn't it? Brothers brothers and sisters, I wonder if we are dangerously in a similar place where we get wrapped up in the partisanism over the politics, we get wrapped up in the leaders over the issues, and we lose sight of us, the people. When President Abraham Lincoln gave his second inaugural address, it was coming to the close of the Civil War. His inaugural address for his second term came on March 4th, 1865. There were hundreds and thousands of people gathered at the Capitol that morning. It was a dreary, bitter, cold morning. It had rained, it had snowed, it had sleeted. It was wretched. The country had suffered years of bloody battle. Families had lost brothers and fathers and sons. Wives lost their husbands, children lost their fathers. The war was drawing to a close, and just a little over a month later. And that morning, as Lincoln looked out on the country that he knew that he'd been called to lead, he knew that they needed unity. He knew that we needed to begin to see one another differently different from every other inaugural address that had come before or would ever come since. He used only 700 words and spoke for only about seven minutes. And his message was driven at bringing back the unity of this divided country. He did not use his time to denounce the Confederacy. He did not use his time to dive deeply into the evils of slavery. Rather, he used his time to help us identify with one another. He pointed out our commonalities, saying both read from the same Bible and pray to the same God. Each invokes his aid against the other, but let us not judge that we may not be judged. Lincoln looked out upon a divided nation, a divided inauguration, and said what we need to do is we need to see one another as people, not as enemies. We need to see one another as brothers and sisters, not as North and South, Confederate and Union. We need to see one another as neighbors. And I think that same truth, that same importance weighs for us today. I believe that next Wednesday, win, lose, or whatever, we have a lot in common with our neighbors. We can never forget that. There's something I like about my street that I live on. 
I live on a, a little extension of a street, and there's only, I don't know, 10 houses on my street, five on each side. And when you turn down all the other streets in the neighborhood, somebody's got a political sign. But when you turn down our little side street, there are no political signs. Not that political signs are wrong. Because trust me, we have some very divergent political opinions on my street. <laughs> but there's an unspoken agreement between all of our neighbors that nobody needs to put up a sign. I know where you stand, you know where I stand, but that's not what's important on our street. You see, we're neighbors. I know you love having your grandkids over to swim in the swimming pool. I know you love playing out in the street with your daughter and your son, riding up and down the street on your bicycle. I know that you love coming over and using the basketball hoop in front of my house and, and playing basketball and shooting horse with my son. You see, the beauty of my street is we know that we are neighbors and our neighborliness, our commonality is what matters. And I wonder, brothers and sisters, come Wednesday next week, can we see that about all of our neighbors? Can we recognize that we all love our kids and our grandkids, that we all value our country and want what's best for it? Can we agree that we love this natural world and we want to give it to our greatest, greatest grandchildren? We all ascribe to the idea that people should be able to get ahead in life and that everyone should get a fair shake. It doesn't matter where we stand on the issues. Come next Wednesday, I believe that is something we all have in common. Can we remember that we are neighbors that have a whole lot in common? See, after Lincoln reminded us that we are very similar, he used the last paragraph of his speech in a sort of prayer. Lincoln's last paragraph of his inaugural address turns to the topic of love and, and how we will move forward as a nation. Listen closely. with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we're in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who, have sh who shall have borne the battle, to care for the widows and orphans, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. You see, as Lincoln reminds us that we are united, Lincoln reminds us that the way forward is one of love. And brothers and sisters, in Christ, come next Wednesday, win or lose, we are known by our love, are we not? Jesus says it again and again. They will know you by your love. As Christ followers, can we reach out in love to one another? At Upward, they, they teach that there should be no poor winners and no sore losers. As the kids play on the football field or the basketball court, they want to be good sports about it. And it doesn't matter who wins. In fact, they don't even keep score. Although I promise you, every single kid on that field is keeping score. <laughs> and they teach them that how you act after the game matters just as much as how you played the game. Brothers and sisters, the love that we can bring to the table matters. And so come next Wednesday, can we reach out to one another and listen? Because there are going to be people who are hurting. I know it. And there are going to be people who are excited. And can we, in grace, just listen to one another? 
Sometimes you just got to vent. Sometimes you just got to be heard. Sometimes you just got to know somebody cares. The other day at the office, I had a client walked in. This was amazing. The office was filled. Most of us had clients in front of us, and and my wife looked up at the counter, and, and she saw this woman standing there, and, can I help you? Yes, I need my insurance. And the woman proceeded to tell us her life story as how her brother is suffering from cancer, how she hasn't been able to meet her bills, how she's lost her job. She started to cry three minutes into this tirade, and she started to sob uncontrollably. And my wife called her over to the desk and said, just have a seat, and and handed her some tissues. And she kept talking for the next 10 minutes at my wife's desk. And she finally composed herself, and she said, thank you, and left. (laughs) We never quoted a policy. We never sold a thing. I don't even know what the woman's name was, but she came for a counseling session. (laughs) There are going to be a lot of people like that next week. And it doesn't matter what your agenda is walking into the conversation Your job in love is to just love them. And we do this because win or lose, we follow Jesus, don't we? We follow the Christ. We don't follow Christ the way the Corinthians were eager to follow Christ. We don't follow Christ thinking that somehow it makes us better than others. We're not better than the Catholics. We're not better than the Jehovah's Witnesses. We're not better than the Lutherans. We're not better than the Evangelicals. We ain't better, y'all. We simply follow Christ. We simply believe that Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. We believe that Christ has transformed each and every one of our stories. We believe to the same effect as Paul, that it doesn't matter how we baptize, for Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. The good news is what matters, says Paul. Baptism's great. Baptism is an admission into the church. Baptism is a blessing and presence of the Holy Spirit. It's great, but I was called to share the gospel, says Paul. And you were too. Paul says, I share the gospel not with clever speech for fear that the cross would lose its power. You see, I share the gospel in plain and simple terms so that people understand. I share Christ so that people will allow Christ to transform their lives. I don't need people to understand and believe Christ the way I do. I need people to have Christ for themselves. And allow Christ to transform their lives. Because if I talk them into something, if I negotiate them into something, if I bargain with them into something, they're going to lose it. But if I just represent Christ, if like you, I am the hands and feet of Christ, then there is life transformation. And it happens. I got a lot of stress and concerns over next week. I'm passionate about my vote. But at the end of the day, what matters to me more is Wednesday. It's how we will change the world. Yeah, your vote matters. Yeah, your vote can influence the future of our country. But your actions will influence the future of our community. So, brothers and sisters, I invite you to engage the elections in a new and different way. May you carry the unity of Christ with you, always. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me? Oh, God. God, we need you. God, we love you. God, we thank you. Lord, some of us are stressed out about next week. Some of us are stressed out about this morning. Some of us just live in a chronic state of stress where we can't fix it. We can't control it. We can't 
do it on our own. And so, God, this morning we turn to you. We turn to you with our stress. We turn to you with our heart's deepest concerns. We turn to you in faith, knowing that you are a great and powerful God. You are a mighty, miracle-working Savior. You are a God of love and possibility. And so, Lord, we pray for your spirit. We pray for your presence in our lives, in our communities. We pray that you show up in our neighborhoods, and our streets. We pray that you protect our children and our schools. We pray that you reach out to the communities still suffering from hurricane damage. We pray that you reach out to the, to the places of pain and sorrow and violence. We pray that you reach out through Israel and Gaza and Lebanon and Iran. We pray, God, that you reach out into Ukraine and Russia and North Korea. We pray, God, that you reach into our lives and remind us that you are still on your throne. We pray, God, that you might send forth your Holy Spirit to bless us with peace and healing. God, may we be your ambassadors in this world. May we be passionate about the issues that matter to us. But more importantly, may we be faithful to be your people, bringing unity and love in all that we do. We pray this, God, in Jesus' name, and all God's children said, amen. This morning, we turn our attention to our offering giving of our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings. And in a moment, the baskets are going to pass around as they normally do. And and this morning, you have a unique opportunity. I know some of you give online, some of you text, some of you already have it set up, and you're like, I don't need that basket. But this morning, I invite you to grab that basket because hopefully you brought a pledge card. This morning is uh, Pledge Commitment Sunday, and uh, we're asking you, we're inviting you. Maybe you've never done this before. Uh, to make a commitment, a commitment to Camp Hill, a commitment to God and to Christ and the ministries that that we hope to bring and make possible here at Camp Hill, at CHUM. And and so on the back of the pledge card is an opportunity to fill everything out. Hopefully you got this a couple of weeks ago in the mail and and it had a little explanation with it and and hopefully you've been praying over this. Uh, Maybe you haven't. Maybe you got the pledge card this morning and you were like, wow, that's cool, huh? And hopefully you can take a moment uh, to pray over it now. And if you, don't feel, uh, if you don't feel ready to give a card this morning, that's okay. You don't have to. It's an invitation. It's an offering. Um, and, and if you want to give it later, maybe you want to mail it into the church, or maybe you want to give it at a future week, that's fine too. We use these to try to plan the ministries for the next year, to try to anticipate where our budget is going and, and how God is providing for ministries and, and how our leaders should make important decisions about the resources that we have at our disposal. And so this morning, as you consider what to give, you're giving your tithes, your gifts, and your offerings, you're completing your pledge cards, I want you to know that everything that you give goes to change lives. And you saw that hundreds and hundreds of times over in the parking lot this weekend. Um, Somebody told me that we saw upward of 500 kids uh, through our trunk or treat yesterday. It was so much fun. Um, And and the Upward kids, they came early. They stayed late. They got sugared up. Their coaches hated us. Whatever. It's things that you make possible. So this morning, as you consider your pledge card, as you consider offering your tithes and your gifts, I want to say thank you. I want to invite you to give with a thankful heart and take a look at this video.
stand here together as we close with our final song. Fire in me, 
light of flame in my soul for every eye to see for the sake of the world but like a fire in me brothers and sisters may you go out burning may you go out burning for Christ may you go out burning for unity may you go out burning for peace for the sake of the world may the Lord light a fire a Holy Spirit fire within you. So go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, like...